Great. So thank you all for waiting and joining us this evening. So today's webinar is actually on C, uh, Southeast Asia. Like, is C poised for a better future than US or China? So my name is Melvin. Uh, I'm a senior advisor here with SAIF. And for today's webinar, um, I'm actually joined by uh, Ritesh and also Elvin. And the things that we'll be going through for today is that shown on screen, right? South Asia as an investment region, high blue chip SDRs, uh, regional ETFs, Singaporean companies with a presence with uh, in C, and of course, how to access these investments winning sites, right? Then we'll then move on to Q&A. So again, those who have not scanned the QR code, uh, please do scan it. I'm sure the link will be shown here, right? So give it one last go. And right, so next slide, let's go. So a little bit on today's speaker, uh, Alvin is actually the founder and CEO of Dr. Wealth. Um, basically he covers educational and empowering of investors through his insights, analysis and education resource. Uh, he's been doing this since 2007. And across the years, you know, he has trained more than 5,000 individuals. And he is actually a highly sought after speaker, you know, by, organi by organizations like SGX, FSM1, Maybank, Kimming, Tiger Brokers, and even Sidley as well, right? You, some of you might have caught him on Channel News Asia and also Money FM 89.3, right? He's also a trainer at SGX Academy. Um, his website is also used uh, by us, employees like myself and Ritesh included to run through some things with the clients that we speak to. So yeah, Elvin, say hi. Hi, thanks Melvin for the introduction. Happy to be here. And we thank you for being here as well. Right. So next speaker will be Ritesh. So Ritesh is actually the VP Head of Investments and Advisory Advisory here at SIFE. Uh, previously, you know, he was at Goldman Sachs advising ultra high net worth individuals, family officers, and corporates. And previously he was at Morgan Stanley, uh, accumulating his experience in investments and risk. Right. He also holds an MBA from University of Chicago Booth School of Business. Right. So Ritesh, say hi. Hi everyone, thanks Melvin. Uh, excited to be doing this session today with Alvin, thanks. Right. So, and about us here at SAIF, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Right, so a little bit uh, on us, SAIF, uh, for those who are joining us for the first time, we are a digital platform with a mission to transform the way that people manage and invest their wealth. And you know, we have been working hard across the years to providing the best tools and resources that uh, all of you can actually use to improve your financial position and of course, better outcomes in life, right? So we have, across the years, we have slowly be become an all-in-one shop uh, for all investment needs. Uh, we built this platform based on how we would like investments to be, something that we can proudly introduce to our friends and families. And actually, as of um, this uh, last year, uh, we have had more than 100,000 investors here in Singapore. This equates to around 5% of the population here in Singapore, right? So you can definitely trust us in terms of security, expertise, and transparency in the way that we do our business here, right? So a little bit on, the, on our growth across the years. So we launched back in 2019, uh, quickly followed by a Series A funding of about 18.6 million, and then Series B funding in 2021 of more than 30 million USD. And then quickly following it, we have Sivetrade, our brokerage platform. Um, we even launched our offices in Hong Kong and Australia. And that's the year that we won Wealth Management of the Year uh, in 2022, right? And in 2023, we actually launched Income Plus. This is our fixed income portfolio, which is uh, developed hand in hand with PIMCO and also our cash plus guaranteed, our fixed deposit type uh, investment product. And we also won Wealth Tech and Personal Finance Tech Award in 2023. Right, and here we are, we are supposed to do a little poll here, Amanda. So we asked a couple of, oops, sorry, is this live and running?
It's okay. Anyway, this is a good question that we want to start off the webinar with. Uh, which ASEAN country actually boasts the largest economy measured by GDP in 2023, right? Um, from the screen, I'm sure most of you would know that the largest economy might be the most unassuming one. And I think if the participants, we can slowly see the answer shown on screen, right? Singapore picking up. Just a clue. Uh, interesting politics happening recently in the country. <laughs> All right. Right. So maybe we can stop it right here. But yes, the answer is Indonesia. Um, it outpaces every other competitor that you see on screen here. Um, but yeah, Amanda, maybe you can cut it here and then we can move on to the next question. Right, which ASEAN country has the largest number of 7-Eleven stores outside of Japan? Ah, this one. <laughs> I'm sure Elvin definitely knows the answer to this as well, <laughs> Ritesh as well. But it's interesting to see some girls like Singapore. Really? <laughs> right, so maybe you can stop it right here as well. Right, so the country with the largest number of 7-Eleven stores is definitely Thailand. And this is going to be, you know, this is going to be covered later on by Elvin. So hope everybody have, you know, have their interest in ASEAN ramped up from here on. Next slide. Right, so here I'll pass on to, uh, I believe it's Ritesh, to cover Southeast Asia as an investment region. Thanks, thanks, Melvin. Um, some really interesting results from the poll. Uh, I, I think like, you know, um, it's important that we know, you know, the region that we are in uh, much more closely. So, you know, good, good insights there. Uh, Alvin, again, welcome to the show. Um, I'm sure like you have a lot of perspectives to share from your side as well. I'll kickstart this uh, just covering a little bit more about Southeast Asia as an overall investment region and uh, the opportunities and challenges that it presents. So if you move on to the next slide, um, let's first look at ASEAN in terms of its economic size. So ASEAN in terms of GDP in 2022 was approximately $3.6 trillion and accounted for 3.6% of the world GDP as well. So collectively, it is ranked as the third largest regional economy in Asia and the fifth, fifth largest economy in the world. ASEAN also has grown at a quite remarkable rate over the past four decades um, at close to 6% annual growth rate over the bulk of you know, the last decade or so as well. Now, looking forward, of course, after weathering through the COVID downturn, growth in ASEAN is actually set to pick up again from 4.2% approximately to 4.7% in 2024. And now if you compare it against some of the, you know, global, uh, you know, economies, which kind of like over also overshadows, right? Like, you know, the news bites that we see in the market and all. Uh, if you look at the world GDP remaining more or less flat, the US GDP coming off and China GDP continuing to slow down, um, ASEAN is one of the green shoots in terms of, you know, a place where GDP continues to have a po positive trajectory as we move forward and the growth continues to kind of increase. Now, of course, from an investment perspective, returns have been a bit disappointing in the ASEAN region. Um, if you look at last year, the global equity markets gave close to double digit returns while the ASEAN you know, index lagged and it was kind of flat for the entire 2023. Within ASEAN, um, there were some you know, green spots again as well. Uh, Indonesia, for example, um, came up with uh, around 11.5% uh, returns on a 2023 basis. Uh, Singapore also ended positively at 6.5% approximately um, and more or less kind of driven through strong kind of economic fundamentals and 
a more kind of stable macroeconomic outlook and all as well. Uh, but on the other hand, countries such as Thailand, you know, gave negative 11 plus percent returns, as well as, you know, markets such as Malaysia and Philippines ended flat for the year. Now, despite ASEAN's kind of soft return that we saw in 2023, uh, there are definitely, there are a lot of opportunities that can be found in the region in 2024 and beyond. In fact, ASEAN is on track to emerge as one of the global growth centers as we move forward. And, you know, what this chart again depicts is an acceleration in GDP growth compared to, you know, how we were the last year. Now, if we move on to the next slide, uh, when we look at the drivers of economic growth, ASEAN is a region which is, again, sometimes overlooked for its potential and overshadowed by all the, you know, bigger economic powerhouses like China, US, you know, India, Japan, etc. Um, yet, I think in more recent years, ASEAN has definitely emerged as a more dynamic and rapidly evolving mm -hmm. economic hub. And it has displayed also a lot of resilience when it comes to, you know, the unprecedented challenges that we have seen uh, unfold uh, in front of us, including the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. Uh, Peter. Hi. Is there a problem? The There's some disturbance. All right. Okay, let's continue. Now, in terms of uh, the key growth drivers, if you go back to the previous slide, um, there are a few reasons for us to be excited about Southeast Asia. Um, sorry, I think there's a bit of a noise. Amanda, could you help, uh, you know, mute one of the participants? I think uh, it's creating a bit of noise. All right. I think much better. Okay. So just looking at some of the growth drivers, uh, number one is obviously the young population. Overall, the ASEAN population is $650 million, uh, sorry, $650 million in total. And uh, uh, in terms of the younger population, it represents almost 34% of the ASEAN population as well. Uh, so, so from a demographic dividend perspective and a youthful population perspective, it creates a much more favorable context from an economic outlook that can be accelerated as we move forward. Similarly, I think if you look at, you know, uh, things such as, you know, rising income, uh, which can be boosted through the tourism industry, through, you know, other parts of the economy, which leads to steady, you know, private consumption, especially in countries such as Indonesia and Philippines. These are, again, green shoots that you observe in the economy as well. Uh, in terms of, you know, regional integration, this is something, again, which is becoming much more prominent. Um, if you guys have heard about uh, this uh, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP, it is something that is done to bring, you know, um, uh, all the trade flows and everything much more, you know, streamlined uh, with, uh, you know, ASEAN becoming kind of like the, you know, hub for, you know, all of these aspects to flow through in a more, much more like free flow basis and all. And a lot of these global, you know, trades that were disrupted through the COVID pandemic can be reinvigorated through these mechanisms as well. Um, on the innovation side, it is, you know, countries such as Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, leading uh, a lot of these electronics-led export growth, uh, the demand for industrial elect electronics is also surging with Industry 4.0, as well as 5G kind of rollouts as we move forward. And more strategically, I think uh, ASEAN is increasingly becoming an alternative location for a supply chain diversification perspective as well. And it will continue to exp experience an increased influx of fixed um, foreign funding uh, as a result of that as well. So these are all things that we should be excited about when it comes to the growth drivers about ASEAN. And um, in, in if you if you move on to the next slide, um, kind of like, you know, going back to what are the individual components of this ASEAN equity market, um, the quiz that we, you know, went through, again, Indonesia is actually the biggest economy at $1.4 trillion. But again, all the other economies kind of add up as well. And each of these economies, you can see that the growth rate is much, much, you know, significant at, you know, close to 5% range, uh, except, of course, Singapore, which is a much more developed economy. Moving on, sorry, uh, moving on. Next slide, please. Uh, but of course, yeah, I mean, it is difficult to access the ASEAN stock market very directly, right? There are a lot of challenges. There are regulatory complexities. Uh, some of the, you know, stock markets like Thailand, Malaysia, 
uh, can be difficult for Singaporean investors to access on a more direct basis. Uh, there is limited research coverage. So this is something that makes it harder for people to understand the different companies and uh, stocks that exist in these regional markets and be able to make a much more informed decision. And uh, then, of course, low liquidity, right? So this is, again, something that impacts how much of an exposure you can take into these different ASEAN markets because, you know, you have access problem, you have research a limitation, and then you know, you are also subject to market liquidity uh, aspects, which means that like, you know, if you buy into something and if there is a, you know, market event and if you want to get out, there could be, you know, a, a lot of price movements, volatility uh, and, you know, poor liquidity that can impact your investments. And that has also kind of limited the adoptability uh, and growth of the ASEAN market in general. But having said that, if you move on to the next slide, this is where things are becoming much more interesting um, we've just seen the launch of Singapore Depository Receipts. This is something which is very innovative. This is kind of in the same uh, line of what you observe in the you know, American markets or the US markets where you have these ADRs uh, of companies which are you know, not originally from the US or America, but they are you know, uh, in their regional perspective, they're pretty big and they can list themselves in the US market and get access to liquidity and a global pool of investors can then invest in a very, very, you know, uh, streamlined manner into these particular securities as well. And these are companies which are, you know, growing at a phenomenal pace. So that same thing is now being implemented in Singapore as well with Singapore depository receipts. And it helps a lot of like regional companies to list themselves in Singapore. Uh, it allows for a global access. It helps in cost simplification. It makes it very convenient, right? You know, like, you know, if you want to, buy into a thailand listed company you don't need to you know open a brokerage account you know locally in thailand you can trade some of these securities now in singapore and singapore market hours you know again from a safety perspective fungibility transparency all of these are kind of addressed through access that has been built from the singapore exchange on this i will port it over to alvin because he will go even deeper and cover how you can access uh, the regional blue chips through SGX. Thanks, Ritesh. Uh, so uh, Ritesh has given the uh, macro view right, or the more strategic view on Southeast Asia investment. So my part is more into the technical components. So I'll be sharing uh, some of the ideas, but of course, uh, these are not meant for recommendation. So this is just for information purposes. So for a start, I'll talk about the SDRs, which are the Singapore Depository Receipts. And uh, for a start, the SGX has launched three blue chip SDRs. And as Ritesh says, these uh, three uh, these SDRs are traded on SGX. So which means you can use a, a side brokerage to assess this SDR as well. Um, just buy and sell as per normal. Okay, so there isn't a necessary. Uh, uh, kind of a hurdle that you need to cross to buy this SDR. So that's how SGX has brought overseas uh, listing to trade in SGX so that it can be a very familiar environment for everyone. And the three Thai SDRs are this CPR, AOT, and PTTEP. Okay, so there's a lot of like uh, abbreviation over here. So let me explain a little bit. So CPR is uh, owned by the richest family in Thailand. Okay, so they do a lot of all those. Uh, it's not just this 7-Eleven picture that you see, right? So it actually goes beyond that. Its empire is large, much larger. I believe some of you probably have seen the CP brand of frozen, uh, I don't know, chicken drumlets in the supermarkets. Okay, so it belongs to that same group. Just that this CP all does the retail side of things. Okay, so 7-Eleven in Thailand is one of uh, their uh, operations. And the second one is Airport of Thailand, which as the name suggests, uh, it runs the airports, especially international airport, which I'll give you a bit more details later. And I believe uh, quite a number of you have traveled to Thailand. It's one of the uh, most popular tourist tourism places in the world, not just in Southeast Asia. So definitely a company that own this airport will have a very good cash flow and good revenue generated from tourism. And the last is the oil and gas player. Um, it's a bit unique in the sense that um, it draws a lot of oil, it generates a lot of the oil from the Thailand area, of course, as well as some of the region in Middle East, okay, which I'll also give you a bit more details later. So next slide, please. 
Okay, so CPO is a retailer, right? It's the largest retailer in Thailand. It owns all the 7-Eleven. It has an exclusive license, which means there's no other competitor that can run 7-Eleven in Thailand. And the exclusivity don't just end in Thailand, it extends to Cambodia and Laos. So out of the 10 ASEAN countries, CPO has three exclusive licenses in three countries. And you also have uh, other format of retail, the wholesalers, which is macro. It is like the Costco in the US, which means you bought buy. Um, the choices are more limited, but you need uh, you buy in bulk so that you can buy at a much cheaper price. Right? So those are the uh, wholesalers. And lastly, there's Lotus, which runs the supermarket, uh, just like our Xingqiong and DUC in Singapore. And I believe if you've traveled to Malaysia, you also see some of the Lotus supermarkets. So this is also part of CPO, right? So CPO Lotus uh, supermarket largely found in Thailand and Malaysia. Right. Next. And Thailand is significant in a sense for 7-Eleven because it has the largest number of stores outside of Japan, right? which some of you got it right. And uh, considering that Thailand is not as big as Japan, right, or even say USA or China, but yet it has a lot more 7-Eleven stores. So that uh, goes to show that it's a very important part or integral part of their living uh, lifestyle because um, uh, it, it, it's not like Singapore is very densely populated. Right? It makes sense for you to have a supermarket near us. But in Thailand, it's a different story. It may be a village or uh, more in the suburbs where the population density is not high and it doesn't justify a supermarket. So 7-Eleven works more like a, uh, can work more like a grocery uh, mini supermarket or mini mart in Thailand. So it becomes a very important supply chain uh, for the whole population actually. So hence the 7-Eleven is very important uh, for their daily uh, uh, grocery shopping and stuff like that. Next. And this is to show you across the years, uh, it has di distributed dividends right, in Thai Baht. And um, even in 2020, which we know is where the COVID has happened, and yet it still continues to give dividends. So I always like to look at the past uh, three years, especially during the COVID period, to see how these companies perform and whether they can still uh, perform as per usual uh, compared to uh, during the pandemic. So that is where I think it's a sign of resilience because during 2020, they still continue to give out dividends. Yes, it's, uh, it's, few, uh, it's lesser, but at least it still managed to distribute while majority of the company will probably postpone or delay or suspend their dividends in that period. Next. So they have some growth prospect as well. Uh, as I mentioned just now, they have exclusive licenses for 7-Eleven in Cambodia and Laos. So they have started their expansion in both countries. And Laos, they just started in 2023. And uh, now it's uh, starting to get more stores. And if you look at every year, they will add around 700 over 7-Eleven uh, stores across all these three countries. Next. So we move on to airports of Thailand and this about Thailand, the two key assets of course are the um, the two international airports in Bangkok. First is the Sumanabumi, which contribute about almost half of the traffic uh, among the airports that AOT owns. And the second one is Dongmyong, which is also in Thailand. So these are the two most important international airports of Thailand and it, it they are both owned by AOT. Okay, next. And I just want to quickly highlight uh, the good point about this AOT is that I always see airports more like a real estate business, right? Because you have a, own a piece of land and then you sort of build infrastructure on top of it and you have commuters, passengers flying around from over the world. And the thing about real estate, typically they are written on assets or written on equity, which are the last two rows in this table. They typically are in a single digit, maybe 5 6%, that kind of uh, uh, return on assets. But if you take a look at the airport business uh, from 21.8 to 21.9, before the pandemic happens, you can see that the ROA and ROE are in double digit percentages. Okay, so this is a very high returning kind of business because almost every uh, parts of the airport can use to generate revenue, right? When an airplane parks at the airport, you, they collect uh, charges. Um, they, the airlines uses the counter services they charge, right? Duty free. Uh, they also take a com uh, they they take a profit sharing out of it as well, and plus all the rental of offices and FMB outlets. So almost every inch of the airport they can squeeze revenue out, and hence 
um, you can see that their ROA and ROE are typically very high. So as of uh, FY 2023, they have not recovered back to their pre-COVID numbers yet. Okay, so which means there is some room for improvement. And uh, there's also expansion because they're adding runways um, to handle potential more loads that are coming in. So it's just a matter of time that uh, likely Thailand will foresee uh, beat the, the passenger traffic beating the pre-COVID numbers, right? At this point in time, it's not yet. Okay, so this is the picture to show you. Um, if you just take a focus on just two lines, right? The top two lines, the two purple lines. One is a lighter purple and one is a brighter purple. Okay, so the brighter purple is the latest FY23 and the lighter purple is FY219, which is pre-COVID. Okay, so you can see, yes, there's recovery, but yet it has not surpassed the previous high yet. Um, it's about 70% there. It's about 70% there. And um, with a lot of uh, the Thailand trying to boost tourism, you can see the visa-free um, extension to China, India, and some of the other countries is one of the ways that they want to bring the tourists back. So it's likely the improvement is going to come in the future. Okay, next. So the last Thai SDR is this PTTEP. And uh, as I said, most of their um, oil and gas activity is based in Thailand okay, or Southeast Asia. They also have some oil fields in Malaysia and Myanmar as well. Uh, so uh, uh, Thailand has 63% of the sales volume and the rest, uh, the Southeast Asia is about 21%. So if you add together, uh, more than 80% comes from Southeast Asia. So uh, we know that the the oil fields are very limited around the world. They're just in very strategic places. And uh, Southeast Asia is not known to be a very big oil producer, but yet the uh, PTDEP managed to secure uh, some of these oil fields right, into its uh, uh, portfolio. So I think that is one of the key things because uh, all we, we all know that in Middle East is a lot more unstable in terms of politics. And hence, uh, having that oil and gas production outside of the Middle East uh, is a lot, I would say, less volatile and safer, right? A produce uh, would be able to contribute an alternative to the global supply rather than relying always on the Middle East. Even that said, they do have some Middle East assets. So about 15% come from that region itself, but majority comes from Southeast Asia. Okay, next. Um, one thing I like about PTDP is that they are very clear with their presentation of their uh, cost and selling price per barrel. So for every barrel, it's not just the crude oil, it also has the natural gas that's uh, within it. So uh, average out the per barrel is about equivalent to a crude is about uh, $26.63. So that, that's what caused them to produce one barrel in three quarter, third quarter in 2023. And uh, they would also give you the selling price, the average selling price, which is in the next slide which was at $48.62. So you will be very clear that they uh, have a very profitable, almost double, right? So they actually managed to sell almost double the cost of producing the barrel. So the, this kind of data is always presented on a quarterly basis in their uh, disclosures. So it is quite easy to follow if you are interested uh, to look at some of these upstream oil and gas players. Okay, next. Okay, so the idea about this kind of upstream oil and gas player is that um, it can be a proxy to invest in crude oil prices. Okay, because if you want to bet on crude oil, crude oil price going up, you will probably need to buy uh, oil futures, okay, which will need a different account, you need a different kind of a setup. And uh, it is a lot more complicated right? because there's backwardation, all those kind of... Uh, 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 terms that you need to understand and how futures market work. So the easier way is that you can buy some of this oil and gas upstream player and you can see that, for example, this PTTEP, historically the price, share price have always moved in tandem with oil price. So which means if oil price goes up, the share price will go up. So it becomes a very good proxy for you to uh, invest in oil, right, via an oil and gas company. And on top of that, the oil and gas company will still give dividends. Whereas if you buy crude oil futures, you won't get a dividends at all. So hence, um, this is one of the advantages of using oil and gas company like PTTEP. Okay, next, uh, I will probably not, uh, okay, I'll talk about the mechanism, but I'll not talk about the benefits and the uh, risks associated. Well, I can answer some of them in the uh, Q&A later, right? Because Retash already covered some of the benefits. 
Um, how this SDR work is that the uh, for example, let's use Thailand uh, uh, in this case study. Okay, so in Thailand, the three companies will have their stocks trading in the exchange over there. There will be an overseas custodian to hold some of the shares, the actual shares, and there is an SDR issuer who will issue this SDR, and then this SDR will be traded on the SGX. Okay, there are also a group of people called the market makers to provide liquidity, which means these are uh, flow traders who will buy and sell from you, right? You, which means you not necessarily need to buy from another investor. So they can be the middleman that does it to provide the liquidity for you. And you can use brokers like side brokerage to buy and sell this SDR conveniently. And your SDR, depending on how your usual SJ stocks are being custodized, if it's with a broker, then you'll stay in broker. If it's a CDP, then you'll be stored in the CDP. Okay, so this is how the mechanism works. And which means if you really want to hold the actual shares, you actually can convert this SDR to the actual shares. So it is not um, uh, like a, a derivative contract that has no underlying that's there. So there is some security over uh, this mechanism or this product. So hence, uh, this SDR is pretty new and it's not limited to just Thailand. I, I believe that SGX is going to launch more SDR in the future, which will include other countries as well. Okay, thanks. Okay, the next part, I'll talk about the ETF, right? Okay. Uh, there are easier ways to get access to Southeast Asia investments. There are ETFs that track some of these regional indices. And I'll just focus on Vietnam because there is a Vietnam ETF that just got launched uh, traded on SGX. So I thought it might be interesting for you guys to at least be aware of it. And Vietnam is uh, one of the uh, highest uh, growing economy in Southeast Asia, right? Even within ASEAN itself, it is like number two, right? Uh, with a CAG of 7.65% over the last 10 years. And uh, the even compared to Cambodia with a much larger base and compounding a much faster uh, amount, you can see that the GDP has grown to about 400 uh, billion US dollars as compared to Cambodia is easier because the base is smaller, right? And hence Vietnam does present a lot of opportunity for investors. Okay, next. So Vietnam is a uh, rising manufacturing powerhouse, right? Why? Because uh, it benefit from the supply chain relocation from China. And the world is all talking about de-risking from China, how to uh, not be so reliant, especially in the manufacturing uh, side. And you started to see that a lot of these Chinese companies started to move to Vietnam. For example, Apple has also moved out of the production to Vietnam right, via Foxconn, Luxshare, Pegatron, uh, Wistron. So they brought the supplier from China. Okay. <laughs> Uh, other places, including Vietnam. And app apparel has been the case, like Nike and Adidas have moved their production long ago. And also their wages are slower than China because um, we talk about production costs, China is no longer the cheaper, cheapest because over the decades, the production uh, workers have uh, become more affluent due to the pay raise, right? The wages have gone up uh, in tandem with their uh, skill sets, right? So now, the other regions, right, the nearby regions are cheaper and it hence make more economic sense for a lot of all these companies to relocate. And you also have a young workforce, right? So a lot of all these characteristics, uh, Ritesh, I also covered that on a bigger picture just now. Okay, next. The stock performance have also been great, right? The economic growth has indeed translated to some of the outperformance in the stock market. Yes, uh, you can see there's a big jump and then there's a big crash as well. And this is very typical of uh, uh, Southeast Asian markets okay? because they tend to be more volatile in nature right, as compared to the more developed countries' uh, stock markets. And this is typically due to the influx and outflow of uh, funds, foreign funds, uh, during certain periods. So you, does, you do see some such uh, volatility, but overall you can see that the long-term trend um, is still there. Right, uh, it's quite in tandem with the economic growth. Okay, next. So this is the new Vietnam ETF. It's called CGS Fugo Vietnam 30 Sector Cap ETF. Okay, so usually ETF names are very long and very mouthful to uh, talk about them. Um, so basically it tracks 
the the Ho Chi Minh, uh, uh, the most liquid companies listed on Ho Chi Minh uh, stock market. Okay, and you have a choice. You can choose the USD version or you can choose the SGD denomination. Right, the ticker is there. And uh, for a management fee of 0.99%, you can get access to the future of Vietnam, right? So yes, there's a cost to buy ETF, but it gives you a lot of convenience rather than you buy uh, Vietnam stocks directly. And uh, it can be quite challenging because not all brokerages offer that, right? And you would probably need to also be subject to some of the trading rules that's implied by Vietnam. Okay, so typically using an ETF for emerging markets is definitely easier. Next. These are the examples uh, of the top 10 holdings, right? Um, you might not find them familiar, but probably the Vin Group, um, because they just launched uh, VinFast, right? Which is the EVs and they list in the US that created some fanfare a few months ago, right? So they do have real estate investments and you can see that they are quite domineering. They have a few uh, counters that are within the top 10 holdings. But basically, you can see there is a more concentrated uh, exposure to real estate as well as uh, some of the banking or the finance services. Right. Finally, we come to the Singapore listed companies with a presence in Southeast Asia. So I'll quickly run through some of the ideas, right? Because some another way to get access to Southeast Asia is that you can also invest in companies that are listed in SGX. But most of the revenue generated is from the Southeast Asia region, right? So I uh, just run through some of the ideas with you that you can, uh, of course, do more studies on them. So the first is UOB. Out of the three local banks, UOB has the most Southeast Asian exposure, right? So for DBS, typically it's a lot from China and uh, India outside of Singapore. But for UOB, um, you can see their exposure to Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, would represent more than 20%, it's about 25%. Okay, so it's the largest among the three banks. So if you include Singapore, it's, it, it's almost 80% from Southeast Asia. So that is uh, why UOB is a proxy to a Southeast Asian growth uh, prospect investment. Okay, next. This is Jardin Cycle and Carriage. Okay, so it has a uh, myriad kind of uh, investment in different regions. Um, the biggest investment is definitely in Indonesia. Uh, this automotive company called Astra, right? So they have a 50% stake in there. And in uh, Myanmar, they have this Thako, which is also another automotive plus, real estate plus, agriculture businesses. And uh, in Singapore, Myanmar, uh, oh sorry, Thako is in Vietnam, right? So in Singapore, Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, Malaysia, and Indonesia, they also have distribution, right? Which is the uh, name of cycle and carriage. Indonesia is Tunas. So, and uh, they distribute quite a number of cars, not just uh, uh, Mitsubishi, Mercedes, uh, Kia. Uh, so quite a number of brands in the region as well. So they also have other investment in uh, Vietnam, right? Vietnam Milk, uh, they also have in Thailand investment. So you can see that their presence is 100% in Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, right? So they generate from different countries, uh, probably about five of them of the ASEAN countries. Okay, next. Of course, ThaiBev is a Thai company that is listed in Singapore, but they don't just have uh, Thailand exposure, right? They also have uh, Vietnam after they bought the Sabaco, which is the uh, beer Saigon uh, in 21.8. And that expanded their uh, operations, they are, they are first in route into Vietnam as well. So Thailand is 71% revenue from uh, from the country and 22% is from Vietnam. And so again, more than 90% from Southeast Asia itself. Okay, next. FNN. FNN is actually a subsidiary of uh, Thai beverage. Okay, so this is the breakdown, right? So they have mainly Southeast Asia exposure. Um, this should become it should come familiar to you, right? They have the not just the FNN soft drinks, but the seasons tea, uh, the magnolia milk. So they do have all these uh, fast moving consumer goods. Uh, is a specialist in that area, and uh, it's mainly in Southeast Asia revenue. Next, QAF. You might not be familiar with the stock name, but you should be familiar with the brand. 
brand, which is Gardenia. So QAF runs the Gardenia brand of bread. They produce it on a daily basis. And again, they are Southeast Asian presence, 100%. Uh, mainly in two countries in Southeast Asia. One is Singapore, the other one is Philippines. Okay, Malaysia uh, they, is the third largest, right? But uh, Philippines is the largest, second is Singapore. Uh, beyond Gardenia, they also distribute some of these uh, farmland brands on Cowhead. You would see these brands in a supermarket easily as well. Okay, next. Delphi, uh, you might not be familiar with this brand okay, because this is, uh, but in Indonesia, it's the more popular one. Right, They generate the majority of their revenue from Indonesia and after that, it's a regional market. So they typically sell in the more uh, emerging or even frontier markets, uh, not so much in the developed market. So this cheaper version of probably the American brands, okay, which uh, some of these developing countries may find it more affordable. So that's their value proposition. Okay, next. Miwa is a Malaysian company. So it does uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, cooking oil, uh, condensed meal, quite a lot of this Oki brand. Right? Might not be, again, not be familiar with a lot of uh, Singaporeans because probably you went for another brand more than this. But in Malaysia, it's quite popular. Right? So uh, this brand in that uh, uh, in, in Malaysia is more popular than in Singapore. Okay, so hence, I think that uh, some of you who are not so familiar, you might find these names uh, you know, more foreign. Okay, next. Hyphens Pharma is, uh, they do this, they do have some proprietary drug, right? Like this uh, Ceridon, which is uh, more for skincare, okay? more for skincare. And I only came to know this company because my wife, had some of the products lying around. So I didn't know that it was Hyphen's Pharma until I find it out. Okay, so uh, another tip is that actually whatever your, your spouse use, okay, it actually can be a, a good trading idea. Yeah, I can ask her for product review as well. And they also have another brand, which is the, uh, I think Ocean something, right? which, which sells supplements, right? Like fish oil and things like this. Okay, so these are the proprietary brand, but they also do distribution of major brands like Bosch and Loam, eye drops and things like that in Southeast Asia. Majority of the revenue comes from Singapore and Vietnam. Okay, so, so Southeast Asia focus. And we have Hourglass, 95% uh, of the revenue derived from Southeast Asia and they sell, of course, luxury watches, watch brands. Okay, um, majority of revenue actually from Singapore, but uh, they didn't break down further, but we should be able to... Uh, know that 95% or majority comes from Southeast Asia. Okay, next. Binance Tree is a high-end hotel resort spa operator and they also <clears throat> do sell some of it as uh, residents and ho holiday houses, right? So 74% of their revenue is generated from Southeast Asia. So they have very unique uh, flavor, uh, the really very typical Southeast Asian designs, uh, which are very different from probably how an American brand will operate. So they do have some of this uh, value proposition that's unique. Okay, next. I think that's probably the last example. Oh, okay. Yes, there's a last example. And this is a table uh, to compare their uh, metrics, right? Their revenue growth, their P ratio versus five-year average uh, based on what share price. And this is just to give you a, a flavor of uh, how they are trading currently and as well as the dividend yield, right? So generally, I would say that for Southeast Asian equities, they are uh, not as overvalued as, say, compared to the US markets, okay? Um, that said, of course, there's always a perpetual discount for Asian markets compared to the US. Uh, US always demand a premium. Uh, that's one. Second is that the US market has recovered and continue to break new highs. While Asian markets, you can see, especially Southeast Asian market, uh, still pretty much uh, below the high, all-time high that has been, been set uh, previously, pre-COVID period. So there's potentially still much more upside. Like we just say, um, the economic growth is likely going to accelerate in the near future, right? So that can be more upside uh, in the near term and when as, as and when these companies recover. Uh, from the COVID impact because some of them are still reaping from it, right? Like uh, AOT, which I mentioned just now, they have yet to recover back to the pre-COVID numbers. So uh, definitely worth, worth a watch, right? So these are some of the ideas that you can take a closer look going forward.
Awesome, Alvin. That was incredible. Yeah, I think like you know, I learned a lot about a lot of these individual companies and uh, brands that potentially like you know all of us use on a day to day basis or are exposed to in some way or the other. But uh, you know, just seeing them on one screen and going through them uh, was was pretty good because now we can associate much better. Uh, and and not just that, like you know, now what it I think does is it gives us so many different ways to take exposure. Uh, within the Southeast Asian economy. So whether it is through the SDRs that have come in, which is an innovation that is being done here in SGX, uh, whether it is through ETFs, you know, to get a more wider exposure in a diversified manner, um, or if you want to take, you know, individual exposure into companies which have, you know, regional presence as well. So yeah, I mean, those are great ideas. And like, you know, I I'm sure a lot of our you know, um, uh, investors today uh, would uh, love to dig in a little bit more deeper and explore what these companies do as well and look at their metrics, et cetera, as well. Now, of course, if um, you, um, you know, everyone uh, who is attending today want to access these investments, we do have a uh, linkage to the SGX. So we have the Scythe brokerage platform and it's fairly straightforward for you to use it, right? So if you go onto our app, um, the there is a discover section and within discover section there are a bunch of different screens that you can use to screen so you know whether it is ESG investing whether it is these SDRs so that will feature in the ASEAN Tigers theme if you want to browse by sectors you can browse you know REITs uh, you can browse other sectors such as energy um, you can also go by analyst picks right earnings momentum so these are you know other metrics through which people typically use to filter out stocks and pick individual securities to you know buy and sell uh, of course we also give access to the us market as well so same thing you know whether it is sector wise exposure theme exposure or analyst related you know recommendations you can go there too and the newest feature that we have added is the bundles and through bundles you can now take exposure into multiple securities in one click so if you want to follow Warren Buffet as an investment strategy, or you want to just buy the Magnificent Seven, you can just do all of them at one click. And the good news is right now, these are you know available at 50% of the cost that you would do on you know when you buy them individually and sell them individually as well. So again, very easy to access, you know, go through the home, go to the brokerage, and then you know uh, once you come to the brokerage platform you can go to the discover section and go through all of these securities now again the good news is some of these themes etc that we have been talking about we are actively looking to convert them into bundles and right now while the bundles are only available on the us market we will you know soon add access to some of these securities that we've been talking about uh, and create bundles out of them such that you know if you just want to take you know a more uh, diversified exposure, you can just buy them in one bundle rather than taking individual, you know, company risk and exposure as well. So, you know, stay tuned, uh, more stuff coming on this side, but very, very easy for you to express your views um, or, you know, buy into these individual securities or ETFs, as you may prefer, through the Scythe brokerage platform as well. If you go on to the next slide, um, just kind of rounding it off, um, of course, beyond the brokerage platform, we also have uh, two other key pillars through which you can invest uh, as you wish. So the whole idea is for us to make it easy for you to invest the way you want. So on the managed portfolio side, uh, if you do not know how to pick these individual securities, you know you can leave that you know homework with us. We will create and curate portfolios for you and uh, uh, customize it and personalize it to your specific needs and. Uh, demands and objectives. So we have growth-oriented portfolios, income portfolios. We have a REITs portfolio, right? So again, if you don't know which REITs to buy, we have a REIT portfolio, which is highly popular, uh, tracks the largest, most liquid REITs in Singapore and gives you instant diversification uh, into the blue chips as well. And then, of course, we have the cash management where, you know, compared to what yield that you get or interest that you get in the bank account, um, you can elevate your yield by taking exposure to cash solutions, which are built either money market funds, or you can invest into certain solutions, which are now we are building in partnership with banks themselves so that you can get a guaranteed rate of return. So all of these are, you know, places through which you can, you know, invest the way you like and solve for different objectives that you have as well. 
with that, I think we should go over to the q and A. I think we have exceeded the time. So let's see if we can give 10 odd minutes to Q&A. Thank Man. you, Ritesh, and thank you, Alvin. Um, really, I echo what Ritesh mentioned, like there's so much to learn. And I think like um, we don't get enough opportunity to pay attention to the ASEAN market. And it's good to know, like, you know, some of the consumer brands that we use, ah, they are actually ASEAN companies here. Right, so maybe due to the limitations of time, let me do pick uh, one or two great questions. And I think one of the key questions is, what are the key risks uh, investing into Thai SDRs? Uh, am I taking a Thai baht risk or is the currency hedge? Right, so maybe I can get Elvin to answer this one. Sure. Uh, the Thai baht, definitely, even though the... Uh, SDI is traded in Sing dollars, right? You will still be exposed to Thai baht risk because the there is still a forex conversion. The market maker will actually price the SDI in Sing dollar, taking into reference on the spot rate for Thai and Sing. So hence, uh, you can't run away from the forex risk. It is one of the risks that's uh, there. And of course, with all foreign investments, there will also be a uh, political risk, right? Wherever the uh, companies uh, domicile or where the business is going to be. So that uh, risk is, is there as well. And another risk would be the pricing risk. Okay, Because for example, the market maker will always need a reference point where the share price is trading. And they will always refer to the actual shares that's trading in Thailand. And there can be times where the Thai market is closed and Singapore market is open. So which means your SDR are trading, but the Thai stocks are not trading. And hence, the market maker would need to widen the spread, right? That's what they call the, the buy and sell price, right? The difference will, will increase in order to protect the market maker because they, they can't be possibly, uh, they, they could possibly be pricing it wrongly. Hence, they will widen the spread. So there are times like this. And if even for that case, it's on a daily basis because the Singapore market opens half an hour earlier than Thailand. <laughs> so you always have this wider spread at the start of the, the timing. So which means um, to mitigate it, you might want to uh, buy and sell the SDR when the Thai market is open. Right, so that uh, there are some definite ways to mitigate some of these risks, but there are some risks that you should know as well. I see, got it. And since we're on the topic of the Thai SDRs, uh, where are they custodized? Like, uh, the Thai SDRs are either custodized by CDP, right? If you use the CDP account to store your SGX listed uh, counters, or it will be custodized by the broker that you use, right? So that's the custodian service. Either way. Um, as per usual, like how you buy and sell your uh, Singapore uh, stocks. So they'll be customized in the same way. Okay. And maybe a good question that I saw can be addressed to Ritesh. Um, so which Vietnam ETF to buy, right? The SGX one or the Van Eyck one? Look, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, you will have to look at uh, each of these ETFs from, uh, you know, exposure. There are different things that you need to look at when it comes to buying an ETF, right? So number one will be, what is the exact exposure that you're getting? So um, if, we, if you go back to the question, uh, was it like uh, the the latest one versus which one was the other? The SGX oh, one. The, the okay. Singapore one, yes. Got it. So so I think the SGX one, as uh, Alvin was covering, uh, it is uh, a little bit more like, you know, um, um, uh, I would say um, related to the more blue chip names, uh, if I'm not mistaken, versus I think the Vanek one uh, might be a little bit more broader. So I'm not sure exactly what the exposure is, but if you are someone who's looking at taking exposure to uh, Vietnam, then definitely look at the underlying exposure and see how much of the market uh, are they representing. So that's number one. Number two, um, of course, you know, the uh, aspects of uh, expense ratios and management fees are things that you would look at and all as well. Plus, uh, on you know, ex you know, I, again, I'm not sure, maybe Alvin, you would know if the Vanek ETF um, they're referring to is the USD denominated one versus the SGX one also has both USD and uh, SGD, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, plus, um, I think the Vanek one doesn't trade in the SGX, right? So it is, you know, uh, listed in the US market. So again, from a pricing standpoint, there can be more deviations um, when it comes to the Vanek ETFs trading overnight versus uh, I think the Singapore ETF will be much in tune with the Vietnam market during the daytime. So there are all these small, small different considerations that you would do 
uh, to to decide uh, which ETF to buy uh, and why. See, got it. And another interesting one uh, is ASEAN considered an emerging market, right? Across the years, it seems that emerging markets have been underperforming the developed markets. So is the outlook showing that we should start increasing ASEAN uh, positions, I, I would think? Ritesh, what do you think? Yeah, look, I think uh, this is the golden question, right? Like, you know, um, this is something that has been told time and again that uh, emerging markets uh, will see the light of the day. And of course, the, you know, uh, potential growth of the region is a big uh, aspect because of which people want to take exposure into the emerging market. But the reality has been that um, there has just been a, you know, a preeminence of the US market in terms of return. And what happens is, when there is a black hole like that, like, you know, when it keeps giving you high, you know, much, much, you know, uh, 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 much, much higher returns compared to the other parts of the world, the money just keeps getting sucked into that kind of pot. So, of course, uh, again, like, you know, if I look forward, um, as I shared earlier as well, in terms of the economic growth, uh, definitely the ASEAN countries have managed the COVID pandemic much, much, uh, you know, better. They have been much more resilient in terms of how they have managed their monetary policies, et cetera, as well. And as you look forward again, you know, the GDP growth numbers uh, is definitely accelerating in the ASEAN region and the emerging market uh, region versus like if you you know look at the more developing world, the growth looks to be slowing down. So if yes, I mean, if we were to if I were to take a bet in the market, yes, I would look to increase allocation to emerging market and ASEAN as well. Uh, as we move forward compared to the US market and you know some of these other economies where uh, the valuations do look a little bit more frothy. I see. Okay. Maybe one last question for Alvin. Um, I think the the one, the second last one from the bottom, right? So how soon, if ever, might there be a shift from US to Chinese equities as the dominating global market share in terms of capital value? Um, I I would say that the there's an important aspect, or I believe that the investment fund flows are mainly controlled by the US, right? So whether is it we are talking about the largest ETFs in the world is based in the US, the largest hedge funds are based in the US, the largest mutual funds are based in the US, and even if you look at the like the top fifty uh, funds, majority are loaned from the American, um, and that is why I would um, uh, relate to the previous question about emerging market, right? Is that any market that's ex-US is very reliant on US fund flows, right? Because if you talk about, yes, there are sovereign wealth funds in Asia that hold significant stake in a lot of listed companies, but they are not the ones that buy and sell those. They are very uh, 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 patient investors. They just sit there with their stake. They are not going to trade in and out. And which means the strong wealth funds in Asia is not going to provide any liquidity, right? Um, so the a lot of the fund flows actually comes from the US. And as long as there is this uh, control by the US of this fund flow, it will also always mean that when any time there's an issue happening outside of the US, the funds will flow back to the US, right? Because uh, people start to seek safety and US uh, investments are always seen as relatively safer than the rest of the world. And therefore, uh, emerging market always suffer from this drainage of funds during certain times. And that hurts the equity markets, right? And it is not fundamentally that the companies are not doing well. It is more of really a perception and fund flow issue that is really affecting uh, ex-US markets, I would say. Uh, that includes the Southeast Asian markets. Huh? And with that perspective, I would say that from an a investor, right, individual investor, I think the best way to look at this is... Um, any, especially in Asia markets, the when the fundamentals are still there, it's better to invest for dividend gains. Okay, the dividends will be a significant part of a total return, uh, ex-US. And another advantage is that Asian uh, equities, the dividend taxation is much lower. In the US, foreign investors is about 30%. Right? It doesn't make sense for you to invest in dividend stocks in the US. But in Singapore, zero dividend taxation. In Hong Kong, 0% taxation. In Thailand, it's 10% withholding tax. China is 10% withholding tax. So it's a lot friendlier. And when you talk about dividend gains, right, it's independent on fund flows. It's really dependent on fundamentals. If the business is doing well, it can pay out the dividend, you will get the returns, right? So that's why I think that um, uh, investing in 
Asia, Southeast Asia versus investing in US, the perspective might need to be a bit different. It's not so much about capital growth. It's not so much about, wow, I, I need to see this uh, company become the MNCs of the world. Um, uh, you don't see that happening in Southeast Asian companies, right? Even going fully 100% in every country in ASEAN is not possible. Even as we look at some of the companies just now, they are usually dominant in one or two countries in Southeast Asia um, because it's a very fragmented market. Even though it's a 600 million population, but every country at, at different phases of development, there was just one question, right? Is it an emerging market? If you talk about Malaysia, Indonesia is developing, but you talk about Cambodia, Laos is probably frontier. If you talk about Singapore, it's developed. So they have different stages of economic development. You have different culture, different religion, different operating system. So the diversity will uh, prevent a lot of the MNCs from becoming, uh, the Southeast Asian companies from becoming very big. Hence, I would still say revert back to the dividend aspect um, as part of evaluation of a, a total return is a, a more relevant philosophy for Asian investing. Gotcha. Thank you so much, Shavin. That was that, that was really outstanding. That's like we learned a lot from just that. Right. But that's all the time that we have for today. Um, if there's any other questions, do send in to our email, uh, advisory at scythe.com, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. In any other case, any last statement from you, Ritesh, before we close it off? All good, Melvin. Thank you so much, uh, Alvin. Uh, what Once again, like, you know, this was an incredible session, learned a lot, uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, uh, increases our uh, perspective of investing into the Southeast Asian region um, in, in diversified manner or individual exposures um, through the SGX. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you, Ritesh. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. See you all the next time. Bye-bye.